afternoon everyone so i hope you can hear me well so it is my immense pleasure to have with us today tim ravgarten who will present his research uh, in the talk entitled beyond worst case analysis so let me first say first about tim so i i i'm quite sure that all of you are familiar with tim's research he is not really the person that needs a lot of introduction but he is currently a professor in the computer science department, Columbia University. Prior to joining Columbia, he spent 15 years as a computer science faculty at Stanford, uh, following a PhD at Cornell and a postdoc at UC Berkeley. His main interest for many years has been on the boundary of computer science and economics. He has been also doing some amazing research in the design analysis applications and limitation of algorithms. He is a winner of lots of prizes. It's too long to really mention it. Uh, I think that, you know, we all know about his Kalai Prize in Computer Science and Game Theory, uh, Tucker's Prize, Gödel Prize, uh, ACM, Grace Murray Hopper Prize. Uh, and today, will have real pleasure of Tim presenting to us his recent research on beyond worst case analysis. Tim. Thank you, Arthur. So can you see the slides okay and hear me okay? Yes, okay. Great. Okay, um, thanks very much, Arthur, for the, the invitation uh, to speak and the kind introduction. Um, it's kind of funny, just a, a quick story for the, for the audience. Arthur and I actually go way back because we were two of the earlier people working on the on the price of anarchy so it's really i think been about 20 years ago when i was a, a pretty junior graduate student that i first met arthur so it's kind of cool just to fast forward two decades and and, and, and here we are um, i also wanted to thank everyone in the, in the audience for, for joining me i know there's a lot of zoom fatigue in the world these days um, so I'm, I'm happy you decided to spend an hour um, hearing about beyond worst case analysis um, so what, what do i mean by beyond worst case analysis well so to motivate this um, area of algorithms, let me let me point out a kind of discrepancy uh, between the way we teach algorithm design and the way we teach algorithm analysis in in most undergraduate courses. So we're all we're all very comfortable with the idea that there's no silver bullet algorithm. There's no like one algorithmic technique which is going to be the right one for every problem that you ever encounter. Right? We all sort of know that. So given that we don't have one, what do we teach our students? Well, we, we sort of give them a toolbox. So we teach them multiple algorithm design paradigms, you know, thinking like uh, greedy algorithms, dynamic programming, et cetera. So par you know, techniques that work, you know, not for all problems, but for you know, a healthy chunk of problems. So we equip them with these tools and then we also give them guidance about you know, which sorts of problems uh, tend to call out for which sorts of tools, okay? On the other hand, you know, the way we talk about algorithm analysis, again, at least in the typical algorithms course, is we act as if there actually is a silver bullet way to analyze all algorithms. In other words, we focus almost single-mindedly on worst case analysis. You know, if you're lucky, you might see an average case analysis of, of sort of hashing or of quick sort, um, but for the, most, for the most part, you know, outside of advanced classes, the focus is entirely on um, worst case analysis. Uh, but, you know, the reality, which, you know, I think people who do research in algorithms are all sort of well aware of is, you know, there's equally no silver bullet analysis framework that is sort of the right tool for the job, no matter what problem and no matter what algorithm you're looking at. Worst case analysis is not that and no other analysis framework is going to always be the right one either. Um, so, for example, you know, maybe the most famous um, failure case of worst case analysis would be the, the running time of the simplex method uh, for linear programming. So famously, uh, instances called claimant cubes show that the simplex method has worst case exponential uh, running time, but it's basically impossible to ever discover instances in practice where the simplex method runs in anything other than very quickly. Uh, a more modern example might be in the rise of deep learning, where the training problems um, that people solve to train deep neural networks, you know, theory will tell you that in the worst case, those are hard problems, and yet practitioners routinely uh, seem to be able to solve them using really quite simple algorithms, even just uh, things like gradient descent, okay? So beyond worst case analysis is really about looking at sort of more nuanced or alternative analysis frameworks to align sort of how easy or hard uh, problems are in practice or how good or bad algorithms are in practice to align the theory with uh, what we observe. 
So what goes wrong with worst case analysis? So, so why, why are there these failure cases? Well, you know, it's, it's generally because, you know, first of all, um, it can have extremely pessimistic performance predictions, right? So the simplex method does not really almost ever run in exponential time, despite the uh, despite what worst case analysis tells you about it. And then that's particularly problematic when it just translates to terrible algorithmic advice, right? So like if you really wanted to solve a linear, a linear program in practice, I mean, you really, you really would, would want the theory to tell you to use the simplex method over the ellipsoid method. Whereas worst case analysis, if you take it completely at face value, actually tells you, tells you the opposite. And I, you know, the reason this happens is because sort of the, the strength of worst case analysis is in some sense also it's Achilles heel. Right, so the strength being that there's there's no assumptions about inputs at all, so you don't need to have any model of data to commit to. Um, but then that also means you don't have the vocabulary to sort of articulate uh, what might be special about sort of realistic inputs. Um, or you know sometimes you know if worst case analysis has a data model, you know it's something I would call the Murphy's Law data model. So Murphy's Law is the math that says anything that can go wrong um, will go wrong. And worst case analysis, it's, it's mathematically equivalent to the belief that the only instance of the problem that you might possibly care about is an adversarially chosen function of the algorithm you choose to use to solve the problem. Which, you know, like in a cryptographic application, maybe that makes sense, but you know, for most applications of algorithms, that's a, a very paranoid and sort of logically inconsistent way to think about, you know, how to solve, how to solve a problem. So what does it mean to go beyond this? Well, you know, um, it basically means you do need some kind of model of data, right? We would still like to keep the assumptions as weak as possible, but you're going to need to have the courage to sort of deem some of the inputs of the problem more relevant uh, than others. And beyond worst case analysis offers a number of different tools for doing that. We'll see a couple examples today. Now, as I said, you know, there's not going to be like one right way to do this that always makes sense for all kinds of problems and all kinds of algorithms. Um, and that's why it's sort of a rich, uh, sort of, it's really a toolbox of analysis frameworks um, in, in parallel to the toolbox of algorithm design principles um, that we already have. Okay, so that's really, you know, what worst case analysis refers to. All right. And, um, you know, it's not a new idea. I mean, you know, really already in the 1970s, for sure, um, you know, very well-known theorists, you know, like Dick, Dick Harp and many others, um, you know, were looking at alternatives to worst case analysis with an eye toward sort of more meaningful algorithmic guarantees. So it's an idea, but I do think it's really kind of, you know, gathered new momentum over the past decade or so. I think it's just, uh, you know, the, 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 the pace of advancement has increased the connections to practice have increased. Um, and there's really kind of a, a like the last decade, extremely exciting for, for progress uh, along these lines. And so I'm pleased to announce that there's actually a new book which sort of covers all the latest developments. This literally just came out last month, uh, published by Cambridge University Press. Um, because it's such a sprawling topic, it's a pretty sprawling book. So it's uh, over 700 pages, sort of 30 chapters, um, you know, 40 different contributing authors who you see here on the left. So as you can see, it's, it's a it's a stellar group of, uh, of algorithms researchers. Um, 30 chapters, here they are. Um, you know, today I'll talk about um, results that touch on two different parts of the book. The results themselves are too new to have made it into the book, but one will, most of the talk will be about smooth analysis, and there's three chapters uh, on that in the book, chapters 13 through 15. And at the end, I'll say a bit about distribution-free models of social networks, which again corresponds to a chapter uh, chapter 20, chapter 28 uh, of that book. Um, but if any of this sort of piques your interest, you know, I definitely encourage you to, to check it out. I think the last 10 years have been really exciting uh, and I'm really optimistic that the next 10 years are going to be really exciting. Plenty of open questions uh, are stated in, in, in the vast majority of these chapters. Okay, so that's, um, that's sort of what I wanted to say by way of preamble. Um, Arthur, how did you want to handle questions? Did you want to allow did you want to do them all at the end, or what's sort of the, the norm? If anyone has any question during the presentation, please put this in the chat, and I will just forward this to team. Perfect. Otherwise, we'll have questions at the end of the presentation. Perfect. Okay. Great. Uh, then let's move on to really the, the meat of the talk. I, I, want, I want to talk to uh, two recent results in case analysis that I've been involved in. Um, mostly I'll be talking about online learning, and so this is joint work with Nika Hoktalab, who's a professor at UC Berkeley, uh, and her PhD student, Abhishek Shetty. Uh, he's a PhD student at Cornell, 
And then I'll also say a little bit about a beyond worst case approach to community detection in social network analysis. Um, that's joint work with Eden Husick, who's a PhD student at London School of Economics, advised by uh, Lassie Day. All right, so this first, the, the main result of the talk is uh, uh, an application of smooth analysis and online learning. And I don't want to assume that anyone necessarily knows what any of these phrases really means. So I want to start out with sort of a gentle introduction to smooth analysis, then, then I'll give a gentle introduction to online learning, and then we can start you know, talking about what are the main risks going to look like, okay? All right, so smooth analysis. This is, uh, you know, in beyond worst case analysis, many, not all, but many of the analysis frameworks are sort of hybrids, interpolations between average case and worst case analysis. Uh, these are also known as semi run models, wherein uh, an adversary and nature collaborate to come up with an algorithm, to come up with an instance, which then gets passed on to an algorithm. And one semi-random model, maybe the most famous one, one semi-random model um, is smooth analysis, which was invented by Simon Tang 20 years ago now, uh, with the, you know, the context of analyzing the running time of the simplex method. And so the way Spielman and Tang sort of described it, they said, you know, let's think about you know, a two-step process where, whereby the adversary goes first, the adversary picks you know, whatever nasty input it wants. So for example, if you're dealing with linear programming, uh, the adversary might pick one of those clay minty cube instances. Uh, and then nature goes second. Okay, and nature's gonna flip some random coins and apply a small uh, perturbation um, to the input. Okay. And the goal then is to is to argue that the algorithm does well no matter what the adversary does in step one. Okay, so no matter how nefarious the choice of the algorithm and choosing its initial input, once you involve a small perturbation by nature, in expectation an algorithm will form well. So for example, run in polynomial time in expectation. Uh, for any uh, fixed choice by the adversary in step one. That's how Spielman and Tang described it. You know, these days people think about it, you know, it's basically equivalent, but it's a slightly different way of talking about it, is you think about the adversary as choosing not an input, but an input distribution, okay? Now we wanna rule out worst case adversaries. So we don't wanna allow the adversary to just deterministically choose a single input. So that we make a lower bet, we assume a lower bet amount of entropy in the input distribution, okay? A fancy way of saying it might say, you know, the adversary can do whatever it wants as long as its input distribution has sufficient anti-concentration. And a canonical example you might wanna think about is like, okay, the adversary doesn't deterministically pick one input, it chooses kind of like a really small set of inputs and then picks a uniformly random input from that super small set. Okay, that would be that would be sort of the way to interpret this. Um, and then again, the goal is the same. You'd like to say no matter what the adversary does, no matter what you know sufficiently diffuse input distribution it does, uh, your algorithm performs well. It has low running time uh, in expectation. Okay, so that's smooth analysis. Now, this is one of many many different ways of going beyond worst case. And you know, so in general, when you have many options like this. Um, it's sort of my responsibility or, you know, the responsibility of all researchers uh, to give advice about, you know, when might this be the right tool for the job? Okay, so when would you want to analyze an algorithm this way rather than some other way? So let me tell you about sort of two um, signatures of a, of a problem and or algorithm that suggests smooth analysis could be a, a good idea, okay? Signature number one is just, you know, you have an algorithm, you've identified some bad inputs for that algorithm, but just by inspection, you look at those bad instances and they're super brittle, right? So if you perturb them a little bit, you suspect they probably flip from being bad instances for the algorithm to being good instances for the algorithm. And so, you know, if any of you have ever seen the construction of the clay minty cubes, you know, the, the four simplex method to run an exponential time, you look at those examples and intuitively they feel extremely delicate, extremely brittle. Like if you messed with the numbers just a little bit, probably the whole house of cards would collapse. So that's a good sense that maybe smooth analysis is a good tool to use. Here's a second sanity check. It really applies more generally to all semi-random models, not just smooth analysis. Um, but because it's wedged in between the two extremes of average case analysis, you know, say with respect to the uniform distribution um, and worst case analysis, a necessary condition for smooth analysis uh, to be interesting is that there should be a significant gap between what is true in the average case and what is true in the worst case. It should be the case that there are much stronger positive results under the stronger assumption of average case analysis. Okay. Otherwise, you know, if they're almost the same, you know, there's no wiggle room for smooth analysis to be interesting. Now, secondly, when you have a problem where you do have this really big gap between the average case and the worst case, 
now it's it's totally clear exactly what you should be trying to prove when you do your analysis. You should prove that you get positive results that are as close to as good as you get in the average case uh, in the average case as possible. So ideally, you basically extend the average case results under the strong assumption of said uniform imp uniformly distributed inputs. You extend those positive results to the much weaker assumption of an adversary who just has to inject a little bit of randomness into its inputs. Okay, so best case scenario is these the second two boxes on the slide more or less collapse. Okay, that's what you're sort of hoping for. All right. So that's what smooth analysis is, and that's when you might think about using it. Okay. Um, you know, there's there's a there's now a, a pretty nice literature that's developed over the last 20 years. Uh, let me just sort of tell you what I regard as the top two killer applications. First one <coughs> is the original application, sort of uh, you know uh, pioneered by Spielman and Tang, which is proving that the simplex method runs in expected polynomial time in the smooth case. Specifically, the model here that Spielman and Tang considered. An adversary picks a worst case linear program, and then each entry of the constraint matrix of that LP is uh, perturbed by an independent Gaussian random variable with small variance. And so they showed that as long as the variance of each of those Gaussian sort of perturbations is at least one over polynomial in the dimension, then the expected running time of the simplex method is indeed polynomial. Okay. That's a result that has been sort of simplified and improved uh, over the years. And if you want to do a deep dive on this, I highly recommend chapter 14 of the BWCA book by Daniel Ditch and Sophie Huvial. That may be the most well-known application of, simple, of the uh, smooth analysis, but one that I really believe is, is just as interesting uh, has been developed over the past 15 years or so. Um, there's a lot of papers here. I've only shown you some earliest ones on the slide. There's a lot more recent ones as well, which is smooth analysis of running time of local search algorithms. Okay, like a canonical one might be, say, the two opturistic for TSP. And so to be clear here, when I talk about smooth analysis, I'm not talking about the quality of the local optima that you converge to. I'm just talking about the number of iterations of local search you need to run before you converge to some local equilibrium, local, local minimum or maximum, which may be a good one or maybe a bad one. I'm not going to worry about that. Okay? Just like with the simplex method, in practice, local search pretty much always converges very quickly. Okay? It sometimes converges to a bad equilibrium, a bad optimum, we're not worrying about that, but it converges quickly. Like the simplex method, there are extremely delicate constructions showing that most local search algorithms of interest can require an exponential number of iterations to converge to um, a local optimum. Okay? Finally, just like with the simplex method, smooth analysis comes to the rescue. Okay? And it turns out that for most of the um, combinatorial local search algorithms that we care about the most, we now actually understand that in a smooth model uh, with slightly perturbed inputs, the expected number of iterations to a convergence actually is polynomial on the input size, not exponential like it is in the worst case. Here is a nice survey in the book by, by Bodo Manthe, that's chapter 13. I also don't want to give short shrift to chapter 15 of the book, that's by uh, Heiko Roglin, and that's about uh, smooth analysis of the size of Pareto curves, which then has implications for certain enumeration algorithms. Okay. So this is kind of what's out there. And the result I want to tell you about, <clears throat> I really think is a, a fundamentally different, fundamentally new type of killer application for smooth analysis. In particular, I will not be discussing running time analysis, unlike everything else I told you about. In online learning, the primary focus is on the number of prediction mistakes that you make. Is the, object, the foremost objective is regret minimization. And then once you've got that right, then you start worrying about computational efficiency. Okay, so it's really sort of totally different mission of algorithm performance. We will show that smooth analysis again comes to the rescue. Worst case analysis is not helpful, but you can recover average case results even in a smooth analysis setting. Okay, so that's where we're going. So that's the introduction to smooth analysis. Let me give you an introduction to online learning. Okay, minimizing number of prediction mistakes. And <clears throat> at least some of you out there, I'm sure, are aware that. Um, online learning, you know, regret minimization, uh, I mean, that's a really, really well-studied topic. There are literally dozens of papers, if not hundreds of papers, published every single year uh, on this model and its generalizations. These next couple of slides are for those of you that maybe aren't so familiar with online learning, um, and I just want to give you a very gentle introduction to, uh, to you before we move on to kind of a uh, sort of the general version of the problem. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce this through a, a, a game, 
a game which is going to take place on the unit interval, um, where again, you want to basically you want an algorithm that makes predictions and you want to minimize the number of prediction mistakes. Okay. So here's the way it's going to work. It's going to seem pretty unfair, and that's because it is going to be pretty unfair. So an adversary will choose a point that they want you to predict. Okay. Let's say they say, you know, they pick a point from the unit interval between zero and one. Say they say one half. Okay. And now secretly, each point of the unit interval is colored either red or blue. All right. And the algorithm, your algorithm then needs to guess. Do you think one half is actually colored red or do you think it's actually colored blue? After seeing your guess, the adversary then reveals the actual color of the points. Okay. So it says one half, you say either red or blue, and then the adversary says either red or blue. And the goal is to, you know, you're going to play this multiple times. You want to minimize the number of mistakes. Right. So here on the right, this is after the game has been played three times. As you can see, the adversary is asked about three different points, the XTs or the little Xs on the, on the line. Uh, on, the, on the bottom are the algorithm's guesses, so it guessed red, red, and blue. And on top are the actual labels, okay, so red, blue, and blue. So you can see that there's exactly one mistake the algorithm made, and that's on the, that's on the middle point, okay? Now, many of you I'm sure have already noticed that uh, this is a totally impossible game. Right, because the adversary gets to reveal the color after we've made our guess. So the adversary can literally just say blue whenever we say red and say red whenever we say blue and force us to make a mistake at every single time. So let's make things, let's restrict the adversary a little bit um, beyond that to try to make this non trivial. Let's say, you know what, I'm going to promise you that whatever the coloring of the unit interval is, it's very well structured. Okay, so it corresponds to what's called a one threshold. So I promise you the unit interval is a red segment followed by a blue segment. So the only thing you don't know in advance is exactly where the transition point is, okay? Where it turns from red to blue, okay? The adversary is gonna be restricted to, so, so that whatever it's told you, whatever sort of points and colors it's, 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 it's um, given out, those are consistent with one of these 1D thresholds. All right, but you think about this a little bit, and you realize, actually, you know, we're still toast. There's still nothing we can do, right? Why? Well, you know, so obviously we might make mistakes early on. The hope is that, you know, we learn from our mistakes and therefore get accurate over time. So the adversary, you know, maybe just asks us about one half and, you know, who knows? We know nothing <laughs> about the color. So maybe we guess blue, you know, who knows? And the adversary says, ha ha, no, sorry, it was red, okay? So at this point, you know, and that's totally consistent with any 1D threshold where the transition point is to the right of one half, okay? Notice we have learned from this mistake, right? We do now know that the entire left half of the unit interval has to be red. So if you asked us about any point less than one half, we would, we would definitely know what the, what the label is. It would be red. We just don't know about it's to the right of one half. So naturally, the adversary will next ask us about something to the right of one half, say three quarters, Again, it could be red or blue, we don't know. You know, maybe we guess red, you know, maybe we guess that the threshold's even further to the right. Then the adversary can say, you know, ha, no, it's actually to the left. Okay, the threshold is somewhere between one half and three quarters. So now again, we know that anything to the right of three quarters is blue, but we don't know what's up between one half and three quarters. So the adversary can ask us about five eighths. You know, again, maybe we guess that it's blue and the adversary says, no, ha, it's actually, it's actually red. And so now we know the threshold's between five eighths and three quarters. And clearly, we can continue doing this till the cows come home, right? We can do this for as many steps as we want. We do keep learning with every single mistake. We keep narrowing the window of ambiguity. Uh, however, that is the, the window remains always non-empty, okay? So for an arbitrarily long period of time, the adversary can force us to make a mistake every single time step, okay? You know, the same example shows that if we wanted to use randomization, so if our ZT was a guess of distribution over red and blue rather than a deterministic guess, the adversary could still force us to be wrong half of the time, right? There's nothing better, there's nothing we could do that would be better than random guessing if, if, we, if we used a randomized algorithm, okay? And so that's a total disaster, right? So it's a bummer we can't say anything. So, so really, you know, as far as, you know, if, 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 we're doing it, if we're doing analysis trying to learn about what might a good algorithm be for making production, uh, predictions, worst case analysis tells us literally nothing. It says literally, no matter what algorithm you use, it is as bad as it could possibly be. You will make the maximum possible number of mistakes. So literally there's zero information content about what a good algorithm might be if you do worst case analysis.
That's the bad news. The good news is, remember, I said, what's the signature where a smooth analysis might come to the rescue? The first signature is that you have very brittle, bad inputs, okay? And boy, does this example seem brittle, right? You need, the adversary needs to keep making use of higher and higher precision as this process goes on, okay? And so it seems like any perturbation of what the adversary is doing would actually, the example would break down, okay? And, you know, it would be easy to prove this formally, but let me just sort of hand wave through it, right? So imagine we were in a smooth analysis uh, where, you know, the adversary can, again, you know, can try to pick a data point, picks XT however it wants, but then nature will intervene and perturb the data point chosen um, by the adversary by a little bit, okay? So a little bit of anti-concentration. Uh, well, then, you know, again, with every mistake you make, you're, you're narrowing the window of ambiguity. And eventually, the window of ambiguity will be so small that no matter what the adversary does, the perturbation will almost surely have, take it out of the window of ambiguity. It'll either sort of perturb it to the left of it, in which case you know that the answer is red, or it'll perturb it to the right of the window of ambiguity, in which case you know that it's blue. Okay, so it will be very unlikely um, that you don't just know the correct answer once the, um, once the adversary's choice gets perturbed. Okay, and so as a result, you will be you will not be making mistakes kind of forever. Okay, so with every mistake you learn stuff. Once you've learned a lot, you'll almost never make a mistake again. And so formally, the way we'll state the goal is that the fraction of time steps where we make a mistake will go to zero as t goes to infinity, or equivalently, the number of mistakes we make grows only sublinearly with capital T as the time horizon capital T goes to infinity. Okay, and that's going to be our goal moving. So good predictions for us will mean that you know as time goes on, we're basically never making mistakes in this sense. Okay. All right, so that, that's hand wavy, but I hope it's convincing that actually, you know, for this 1D thresholds learning problem, you know, worst case, you know, you can say anything. Uh, in the smooth adversary, it seems like you can totally get positive results, right? We haven't worked out sort of the parameters, but it just seems clear that this is, this is true. Now, this is obviously just a very toy model, you know, just sort of this game on the line with 1D thresholds. So for, for an actual research kind of result, what we'd really like is sort of a general positive result saying that you get these kinds of, uh, you get you get something similarly positive for kind of all online learning problems, provided you have a smooth adversary, provided the adversary's choices are, are highly perturbed. All right, this is another good place to pause for questions, if there are any. Yes, any questions? If anyone wants to ask any question now, please ask in the chat. So chat. There is one question. Is this an answer? An asymptotic notion. Uh, by this, I, I take it you mean the sort of sublinear in capital T. Yes. Yes. Um, I mean, so the way I'm going to state it in this talk, yes. So I'm going to imagine, I'm going to imagine, I mean, so think of it this way. Um, for each fixed finite T, you can talk about sort of the minimum number of mistakes that you can make with any algorithm. Uh, and then you can look at that bound and take capital T to infinity, okay? And then that's what should be sublinear. So concretely, you know, we'd like to say something like, you know, I mean, so the way it usually typically works is you say something like for all capital T, here's an algorithm such that no matter what capital T is, I will make at most like 10 times the square root of T mistakes. And that would be, that would be a way that you would satisfy the goal as I put a slide. There is one more question. Can you, oh, uh, can you use randomization here instead of smooth analysis? Yeah, so, um, so if the, it's a good question. Um, so if, if you only have randomness in the algorithm, uh, it doesn't help. And basically that exact same example we did with kind of 20 questions on the line sort of shows that. Um, so basically that example shows that even with randomization, if you have a worst case adversary, you can't do better than a 50 50 guess at each label. So you're not gonna make a mistake every time step, but you'll make a mistake at half of the time steps. And that doesn't satisfy our goal of wanting a sublinear number of mistakes. So you really do, we're, want, we're gonna wind up having randomness in the algorithm also in our solution, but it's provably necessary to have randomness in the adversary or some other way of restricting the adversary. The next question of Ami Pass, does the adversary knows the smoothest result? The answer to the previous queries. Excellent question. Excellent question. Um, that uh, 
Uh, the answer is yes. And that's going to be what's, that, that's a big part of the challenge in the analysis. So the adversary will be totally adaptive. It can condition what it does on anything that's happened in the past. Great question. Okay. So far, so good. Excellent. No more questions. Tim, go on. Okay. Very good questions. Thanks for that. Um, so I, I told you what I mean by smooth analysis. I told you what I mean by online learning. What do I mean? What would I mean by a general result? So we're not just going to look at the unit interval. We're not going to look at an abstract domain. I will assume it's a, a Lebesgue measurable subset of Euclidean space. Um, but so think of it maybe as the unit cube, if you like. And then, you know, just like before we had these 1D thresholds, this promise on what the reds and the blues looked like, that's described through what's called the hypothesis class, capital H. <clears throat> a hypothesis here is really just the coloring. It's a binary function from the domain to red or blue. Kind of abstract, so let me tell you about the types of um, capital H's people tend to think about in learning theory. So first of all, rather than a 1D threshold, you could think about linear thresholds in higher dimensions. So that would correspond to a half space. So maybe capital X is just the unit cube. You slice it in half with a half, with a half plane, and then that separates the reds from the blues. Or if you want to get fancier than linear functions, you could use a bounded degree and vary a threshold function. So in other words, you have a bounded degree polynomial on Rn. Um, and you would just color a point red or blue according to the sign of the evaluation of the polynomial at that point, okay? So when I'm talking about hypothesis classes, capital H, these are the types of things I need. Lots of other examples as well, but these are good running examples to, to have in mind, okay? And then the game with the worst case adversary works just like before, okay? So instead of choosing a point in the interval, uh, the adversary chooses a point from the main, the adversary has to guess red or blue or maybe randomize over them and then the adversary reveals the actual coloring. And again, there's this promise that the adversary can only um, color things in a way that's consistent with one of the legal colors. It's one of the hypotheses in capital H. And the goal remains exact same. Okay, so we'd like to get what we got in the 1D thresholds case. We would like the number of mistakes to be sublinear in the time horizon, capital T. Okay, so we'd like the fraction of time steps that we make mistakes <coughs> to be going to zero as we get, as we get en enough experience, okay? And then, you know, the research agenda is to understand when is this goal possible and when is it not possible, right? We already know sometimes, we know sometimes it's impossible, like for 1D thresholds with a worst case adversary. We know sometimes it's possible, like with 1D thresholds for a smooth adversary. But really, like which H's and which adversaries can you handle, okay? All right, so what do I mean by a smooth adversary uh, in the context of a general online learning problem? Well, maybe let me tell you what the extremes would be. Okay, so worst case on analysis would just mean that the adversary can do whatever it wants. It can pick any input distribution. In particular, it can pick a single point. Uh, the sort of easiest adversary would be an average case adversary where we force it to actually pick a point uniformly at random from the domain capital X, okay? So in general, we will have a parameterized interpolation between these two extremes. The parameter will be sigma. Sigma equals zero will correspond to the worst case adversary. Sigma equal one will correspond to the average case adversary. Uh, and the formal definition is just that, you know, we insist, so the adversary is gonna pick an input distribution, so over, over capital X, and we insist that it has a density function, and that that density function is point-wise upper bounded by one over sigma times the norm distribution. So think of sigma as maybe like n to the 10, okay, where n is some notion of input size, right? Then we're basically saying like, you know, it's basically like L infinity bound on the density function saying it's never more than n to the 10th times the density of the uniform distribution. Again, zero is the worst case adversary. So we want our positive results to have sigma as small, small as zero uh, as possible. We're not gonna get it for sigma equals zero, but we'd like it to be for sigma as close to zero as possible, okay? So that's what we're gonna mean by a smooth adversary. I mean, this is kind of exactly the same notion that's used all throughout the literature on local search that I mentioned. Uh, earlier. The new game now proceeds as you'd expect, right? The only difference is that nature inserts herself, right? After the adversary chooses their sigma smooth distribution, uh, now nature supplies the randomness uh, to actually realize a point drawn from that distribution. Then the adversary again guesses a color or distribution over colors, and the adversary reveals the true color, subject as usual to the promise that it's consistent with one of the legal colorings we agreed upon in advance. And the goal, again, uh, we would like the expected number of mistakes um, to be growing sublinear with capital T. And, uh, you know, just to reiterate the, the really good question that was asked a few minutes ago, 
Um, hopefully, it's clear from the way I phrase the game, but the adversary can be as adaptive as you could imagine. So when it makes its decision in step one of time step T, so when it chooses its distribution, capital D sub T, it can condition that choice on everything that happened in the T minus one time steps, okay? Its own chosen, cap its previous capital Ds, nature samples the Xs and the algorithms guesses the Zs and the Ys for that matter, okay? All of those, all of that information from the first T minus one time steps is in play when the adversary chooses a distribution of time T. And in particular, you know, what's, what tends, what's, what really complicates things is the choice of capital D sub T depends on the realization of the X's from previous time steps. The reason that makes things complicated is it means that you lose independence across time steps. All of a sudden there's a sort of nasty dependence um, about how future points depend on the realizations of, of previous points. And that really complicates the analysis. All right, so let's go back to our goal. So when can you achieve this for which adversaries, for which H's? And let me remind you <coughs> the second clue that you should be you know, looking into smooth analysis or some other semi-random model, uh, which is that uh, you want to look for problems or algorithms where there's a huge gap between what's true in the average case and what's true in the worst case. So we should talk about you know, what are the extremes for these general online learning problems before we worry about smooth adversaries. So you know, I'll, I'll give a little bit of detail here, but the main point is just that the takeaway is going to be that in the worst case, you can do basically nothing. You basically can never get this goal. And in the average case, you can basically always get this goal, okay? So the rate at which this expectation goes to zero will be different for different choices of capital H, but for almost any capital H that you might think about, you actually can achieve this goal in the average case. Okay, so there's kind of the biggest imaginable gap between average and worst case. You can never do it worst case, you can always do it in some sense, average case. So specifically, I mean, 1D thresholds, we already know you can't do it in the worst case. And almost any other hypothesis class people tend to think about in, has embedded in it 1D thresholds. Okay, so technically it's characterized by having finite little stone dimension. Definition of that is, is not important for this talk. And the point is just that kind of everything has infinite little stone dimension. <laughs> On the other hand, in the average case, all you need to assume is that H has finite VC dimension. Okay, so hopefully some of you know about the concept of VC dimension. Um, I'm not going to tell you the definition of this talk. I'll just tell you about some consequences of having finite VC dimension. But, you know, the, if, you, if, you, if you haven't seen this before, the takeaway is just that kind of almost everything has finite VC dimension. Okay, so like, for example, if you have degree D polynomials in Rn, the VC dimension of that family is roughly N to the D. So again, as long as you have a finite dimension and a finite uh, degree bound, you have finite VC dimension and you can actually get the number of mistakes to the fraction of mistakes to go to zero uh, with capital T, okay? <coughs> so, uh, so that's definitely an opportunity. There's a big gap. And the hope would be that we can actually dramatically weaken the assumption of, okay, so I, I should say, so what do I mean by the average case version, an average case adversary? What I mean is that the adversary is allowed to make only one choice once ever, which is it gets to settle on a single input distribution, capital D, over the domain capital X once and for all at the beginning of the game, okay? And then every single time step, the data point X of T is an IID draw from that a priori adversarially chosen distribution, capital D. Okay, it's a huge restriction on the adversary. That's the bad news for this average case work, okay? So, so now it's also like really clear what kind of result we want. We want to have the, the same conclusions we get in the average case that you can basically always have vanishing prediction errors, but we want it on the, under the radically weaker adversarial assumptions that we use in the smooth case, where all we know is that the adversary's choices get slightly perturbed. <laughs> okay. So um, the result I want to report on is such a result. Uh, so again, this is joint work with Nika Hagtalab and Abhishek Shetty. Um, so we show, you know, what I, you know, in my opinion, exactly what you'd want, right? We get exactly the same conclusion, uh, modulo a tiny bit of fine print around the parameter sigma, which I'll tell you in a second. Um, but you know, for for sigma bounded away from zero, we get exactly the same conclusion we had with the average case adversary. We get it with a smooth adversary. And so again, you can achieve this prediction goal pretty much for any capital H you might care about, as long as capital H has finite VC dimension. Let me just make a couple comments in case there's any learning theory experts <coughs> in the audience. For simplicity, I've been phrasing everything in terms of the realizable case. Okay, that's corresponds to this promise. 
that the adversary has to be consistent with one of the legal colorings we agreed upon up front. But actually, this theorem carries over to the agnostic case, okay, and, and regret minimization. Um, so you do not actually have to have the promise, okay? So the adversary can actually output whatever colorings it wants. You to change the benchmark that the number of mistakes that you make is not much larger than the minimum number of mistakes that would have been made by any of those allowable colorings in capital H. Okay, if that didn't mean anything to you, don't worry about it, right? Um, second thing, so uh, th this thing that's satisfying about this result, which for the most part is not the case for the known smooth analyses of running times that I mentioned earlier, which is that you get quantitatively extremely satisfying bounds as well. So if you care not just about this ratio in blue going to zero in the limit, but you really want to understand how many time steps do you need to play this game before the probability of you making a mistake is going to be less than epsilon. Well, it turns out the rate at which this goes to zero is almost as good as the rate at which it's known to go to zero with an average case adversary that just picks one fixed distribution up front. Now, of course, that can't quite be true because it's got our bound has to depend on sigma. Remember, sigma equals zero corresponds to a worst case adversary, and we know everything blows. Okay, so there is an extra factor that depends on sigma, but it depends only on the square root of log one over sigma, which means that actually we can take sigma to be you know exponentially big uh, and still get you know a reasonable kind of regret minimization. By contrast, most of the local search anal smooth analyses of local search algorithms and of the simplex method, while they give expected polynomial running time bounds, the polynomials are often really quite big just because the analysis is difficult. So the upper bounds there are presumed not very close to tight. Our upper bound definitely is quite close to tight because it's quite close to the known to be tight um, average case uh, bounds. Okay? Also, in the in running time analyses, you actually need the dependence on one over sigma to be polynomial in one over sigma. Um, but here in this different application for regret minimization or you know, prediction error minimization, you actually only have a logarithmic dependence on one over sigma. So that was a very nice surprise um, that we discovered when we proved, proved this result. Okay, and um, uh, just a couple of precursors. So Rackland, Schroederen, and Tawari actually proved the special case of this result when capital H are half spaces, uh, basically using bare hands approach. Um, whereas in a previous paper with Nick and Abhishek, we proved a special case in which we need an extra hypothesis that capital H has a low bracketing number, which is satisfied by many capital H's of interest, but it's definitely a stronger assumption. So this is the first, so this theorem here, this is the first result that achieves the sort of minimizing prediction mistake um, goal with really the minimal possible um, uh, assumption of bounded BC dimension. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm going to have to, I'm, I'm a little bit running out of time, and I do want to say a little bit about the social analysis. Um, so let me just say a tiny bit about the proof of this, but not very much. Um, I'm happy to sort of stay. Um, on afterwards uh, for those of you that are interested in hearing more details. But I do want to at least address sort of questions that probably many of you have in mind. Right, so question number one might be, you know, this is an algorithm seminar, so you might be wondering like, okay, what is the algorithm that achieves this guarantee, right? Very natural question. Remember, a big reason of why we're doing this whole analysis is to get algorithmic advice about how to tackle them. And that's exactly what worst case analysis failed to give us. Secondly, Thinking as a mathematician, you're probably wondering about the role of the hypotheses in proving this theorem, specifically the hypothesis that H has bounded BC dimension. How does that help? And secondly, um, you know, we're assuming the adversary instead of a worst case adversary. How does that help? And this theorem would be false without either of those assumptions. So clearly they must play a big role in the analysis. Okay. Um, so let me just briefly talk about those questions. Um, so how does bounded BC dimension help? Well, let me just focus your attention on answer number 1A here. Uh, basically, what's important is that even though capital H is generally infinite, right, even the family of 1D thresholds is an infinite class, if you have bounded VC dimension, then um, you can really approximate the hypothesis class with a finite subset of it, okay? So, you know, the, the size of the subset you need grows exponentially with the VC dimension, <coughs> but still, it is going to be a finite subset, where at least with respect to the uniform distribution, you know, for any of your original hypotheses, you have hypothesis in H prime, which does almost exactly the same thing, meaning, meaning colors almost all of the points, you know, one minus epsilon measure of the points in exactly the same way, okay? So that's 
sort of the major thing with bounded BC dimension is you can have these finite approximations of the hypothesis class. So now as far as the algorithm, so uh, we're going to make use of that fact, and then we're going to rely on off-the-shelf randomized algorithms uh, for regret minimization. Okay, and you may have heard of some of these algorithms before. Examples would be like edge, multiplicative weights, follow the perturbed leader, etc. Um, so these are randomized algorithms, uh, which sort of guarantee, you know, which give the kinds of guarantees we want, even for adaptive worst-case adversaries. Okay, so these work really well. The cat is they only work when you have a finite number of different options, you know, which for us corresponds to a finite number of different hypotheses. Our original hypothesis class capital H is infinite generally, so it does not make sense to talk about running these algorithms directly on capital H, but it does make sense to talk about running them on the finite subset capital H prime that well approximates capital H, okay? And so that's what the algorithm is going to do. It's going to reduce to the finite case, um, exploiting the bounded VC dimension uh, hypothesis. Okay. All right, so that's, so, so that's, you know, and this is, you know, this algorithm is something, you know, you could imagine using, right? You could imagine sort of sampling hypotheses to construct your, your family H prime, and then these are very lightweight algorithms, multiple weights, et cetera. You could just run this, and that could be your prediction algorithm. So this is a sort of plausible method for how to actually make these predictions um, uh, in this problem, okay, which is what, which is what we really wanted all along, okay? Um, and then you need to do the analysis, and basically the analysis boils down to, you know, how much do you lose by using H prime instead of H, okay? So the worry is that basically um, you're doing fine. You know, if the real problem only had the hypotheses in capital H prime, you'd be doing fine. You would just inherit the no regret guarantee from uh, multiplicative weights. But unfortunately, there's all these other colorings, capital H also, which the adversary is free to make use of. And so the worry is that the adversary somehow conspires to choose its little Lexus, conspires to choose its data points so that, you know, you know, actually just by the finite subset capital H prime, you totally missed out on what the real coloring actually was, okay? That's what can go wrong in the analysis. And so we use, you know, and in fact, it, with a worst case adversary, it literally can go wrong, okay? So, um, right, so this is where the smooth adversary assumption uh, gets used, to argue that actually you do not lose much passing from capital H to capital H prime. Uh, the way we do that is through a coupling method. Okay, so again, what makes this difficult to analyze is the non-independence. So, so first of all, the X's are non-uniform because the adversary can choose any sigma smooth distribution it wants. Secondly, as we discussed, they're not independent either because the adversary can condition its distribution on one time step on the realizations of the X's of previous time steps. So we have a trick for um, dealing with that, which is a coupling argument. So we basically show that it's good enough to analyze a uniform IID adversary, because that's a much stronger assumption, right? Uniform IID rather than adaptive. So it's really just a uniformly random point every single time step. You can, you can get away with analyzing just the uniform adversary as long as you blow up the number of time steps by a one over sigma factor. Okay, so again, as sigma is going to zero, you're heading to the worst case. So this is an X, this is sort of a, you know, unbounded blow up. But for sigma bounded below, bounded away from zero, this is some finite blow up in the number of time steps you need to worry about. Okay, so that's the sort of generic reduction. We managed to show sort of a, a sufficiently large number of just uniform IDs actually wind up dominating, at least from the perspective of the our analysis approach, dominates um, the smaller number of uh, points generated by the smooth adversary, okay? This coupling approach, I believe, is, is, is general, and in the paper, which is on archive, we give other applications, including one to online discrepancy minimization. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that here in the interest of time, um, and so instead, I will take a, a short pause to see if anyone has a question about um, the online learning part, uh, and then after taking questions, I'll say a little bit about the social network analysis part. Okay, so last, I mean, yeah, any more questions in the chat or we can post them after the talk yeah. as you wish? Yes, because I will, I will stick around um, after the talk concludes for a while to, to, for people who wanna, who wanna dive deeper, so. Yeah, okay, so there are no more questions, so okay. team, please go on. All right, so what did we just saw? We just saw uh, sort of, a, I really think a totally new type of killer option 
killer application of smooth analysis, the semi-random model, to a fundamental model in learning theory, a really, really well-studied model in learning theory. Now I want to totally switch gears. Okay, I want to talk about you know a, a totally different application of algorithms, namely social network analysis. And so graph algorithms um, that are sort of specialized to work well on social networks. Now, where does where does the beyond worst case sort of lens come in on that problem? The issue is that like, what do we mean when we say a social network, right? So what, what would a theorem look like where you would say like, on social networks, our algorithm runs in O of n log n time or achieves a two approximation? Like, like what would that even mean? Well, on the one hand, like there, there are these sort of features of social networks that have pretty, they're pretty non-controversial. Like you've probably heard of a power law distribution, degree distribution. Uh, my work is gonna focus on triadic closure. So this is the property in social networks that friends of friends tend to be friends in their own right. So in terms of graphs, two paths tend to close into triangles okay, rather than just be sort of induced two hot paths. Um, so there is intuitively there should be hope of having a mathematical model that captures what's at least some of what's special about social networks. And in fact, there's, there's massive literature just about generative models that is sort of probability distributions that people have offered um, suggesting that you know samples from these models should be good representations of social networks. Okay, preferential attachment being probably the one that, that you may have heard about the most is a zillions others. In fact, you know, 15 years ago, Chakrabarty and Falutsos wrote a survey with literally 23 different models of social networks comparing their pros and cons. That was 15 years ago. So now, as you can imagine, there's many more than 23. And so it's like, you know, so if you want to do like really nice kind of, you know, stock fox soda style algorithms work motivated by social networks, there's this question of like, you know, what should you do? Right. I mean, because you have these like 23 or more models to look at. You could pick one of those models and then design an algorithm and proves that it performs well with higher probability on that model. But I don't know that I really believe any of those models, right? So there's just, there's too many to choose from. And for all I know, they're kind of all wrong in some sense. So that brings us very much into sort of actually what we were just talking about with hybrid models, okay, and average ways interpolations. So here, given that there's so many different proposed average case analyses for social networks in the form of all these generative models, intuitively what I want is I want to take like a worst case over all those proposed generative models of then uh, with high probability or average case performance you know for the given model so worst case over what just over sort of reasonable distributions for social networks and then average case with respect to, to any such model okay now practically you know the, the way that you carry this out is you instead impose combinatorial restrictions on a graph so it's just going to be a restricted graph class you know just like planar graphs bounded tree width you know all that kind of stuff it's going to be a combinatorial restriction on graphs, which is going to be which is going to hold high probability from samples from any of these sort of you know generative models that we were we were motivated by. And so there's been actually I think a, a really sort of exciting sequence of papers you know by a bunch of different people over the recent years. Uh, there's a chapter that I wrote with Chadri in the BWCA book, chapter 28, that's all about you know that surveys all of these results. I'm just going to flash quickly sort of the latest results that we have extending this last point, uh, this ICAL paper with Jacob Fox, Isha Shadri, Fanway, and Nicole Wine on so-called C-closed apps. So just to be clear, the theorems I'm going to be giving you are basically fixed parameter tractable type theorems uh, for computing the maximum clique and generalizations of the maximum clique. Okay. So max clique, I mean, is a really hard problem. Right? It's approximate, but it's even hard to get, you know, fixed parameter tractability results for max clique, except in extremely restricted classes of graphs, right? So like for H-free graphs, for almost all H's, you still can't get FPT results for, for max clique. And we're going to be looking at generalizations of that. So to get any kind of FPT results for these problems, we need to make a, a pretty non-trivial restriction on the graph. The good news is I'm going to give you a restriction, which is reasonably well motivated by the special uh, structure that we know social networks have, namely triclosure that, you know, if people have lots of mutual friends, they tend to be friends in their own right. Okay. So formally, we're going to call a graph C closed. C here is the parameter that we're going to be FPT with respect to. A graph is C closed if whenever two vertices that have C neighbors in common, they must be themselves directly connected by an edge. So you can't have two vertices that are not neighbors that have a, a C or more mutual neighbors. So once you have enough friends in common, you have to be friends yourself, okay? And it turns out that actually 
All right, so again, this comes from triadic closure. Social networks, you know, this is sort of a coarse approximation of what you do see in real world social networks. Uh, and happily, lots of graph optimization problems, uh, which are generally not FPT solvable, do become FPT fixed parameter tractable with respect to this parameter C. Okay, and we've done some in, in, in experimental results as well, showing that many standard social network benchmarks uh, are C close for reasonably modest values of C. Okay. Um, so what can I say here? Um, let me, let's just check for a second. Okay, good. So, all right. So just a couple more things and then I need to wrap up. So, uh, in the work with Eden Husick, we look at a sort of very generic version of a, of a sort of, you know, um, subgraph maximization problem. Okay. So we, we look at, in fact, we look at the more general enumeration problem. So by F graph enumeration, the problem parameterized by a family of graphs, capital F for concreteness, you can think of capital F for now as being just family of all cliques, okay? By capital F graph enumeration, what I want you to do is uh, given an input, an undirected graph, capital G, I want you to enumerate all of the induced subgraphs of G that are maximal with respect to membership in this family, capital F. So if capital F is the cliques, then the goal here is just to enumerate the maximal cliques of the graph, okay? If capital F is something different, you'd be enumerating the maximal things from capital F, okay? And moreover, I would like I would like an algorithm which is output efficient, okay, which uses polynomial time for each such subgraph, okay? Of course, this is more general than finding the max cardinality subgraph member of F, because you could, if not, let's just enumerate all of them and remember the biggest of them. Okay, so enumeration is a sufficient condition for maximizing a number of vertices in an induced subgraph from capital H, from capital F, excuse me, okay? So um, in the work with, with Eden Music, what we do is we show that for uh, many different classes of dense graphs, capital F, you actually can solve the enumeration problem and therefore the cardinality maximization problem uh, in fixed parameter tractable time. Again, fixed parameter respects to the parameter C, C in the definition of C closed, okay? So for example, as long as it's the case, then you know whenever two vertices have 10 neighbors in common, they must themselves be directly connected. As long as your graph satisfies that property, then in fact, we will be giving you a polynomial time algorithm uh, for computing you know, the maximum clique or the maximum dense subgraph for a different, a number of other um, possible definitions of dense subgraphs, okay? And um, we also show that these results are in some sense the frontier of you could expect, uh, kind of in two senses. Um, so, I mean, basically, you know, so we identify several capital Fs where you could do this, notions of dense subgraphs, and we show that kind of like the, the next most relaxed definition of dense subgraph you might look at, like for example, having a bounded average co-degree, are not good enough. You actually cannot, you provably cannot get FPT enumeration um, if you weaken the assumptions much compared to compared to what we did, okay? So I know this was fast, but I mean, the takeaway from this part is that, you know, the in principle, one could have arrived at sort of defining the graph class of C-closed graphs just from first principles. That is not how we did it, okay? We really did it exactly through the methodology I told you. We were taking a beyond worst case lens to, um, you know, the on, you know, what social network analysis had been doing through these all these competing generative models. And we came up with the definition of C-closed graphs uh, because we wanted to have theory that spoke simultaneously to all of those models. Not much a beyond worst case uh, way of thinking. And so happily, we now have, we now have this uh, new definition of a graph class, C-closed graphs, um, which you can do all kinds of fun things with. Um, and it is sort of a, you know, it's a reasonably strong assumption, but actually, you know, we're, we're getting significantly stronger algorithmic results than are possible for, you know, most other graph classes, in particular, FPT algorithms for both maximum clique and generalizations thereof. All right, I'll skip the techniques here and conclude with uh, two open questions. Um, so again, in general, the, the most of the chapters in the Beyond Race Worst Case book uh, point out concrete open questions and directions for future research. Let me just highlight two that sort of, you know, um, come up in, in, in the two results I talked about today. So the first one is, as I discussed, if you look at the learning algorithm we used for minimizing the number of predictions, that was not computationally efficient. And that's because in the first step, you have to somehow construct this exponentially big uh, family capital H prime of hypotheses that well approximates capital H. 
And so an open question is whether you can get analogous um, sort of mistake minimization guarantees uh, for an algorithm which is computationally efficient. Okay? I think probably you can, and that would be quite a nice result. So in the, in the second part that I went through very quickly, I did mention that really, you know, we focused on enumerating maximal subgraphs from some family. And then, of course, as a consequence, you can also maximize the size of a subgraph from that, just by enumerating and remembering the one with the largest number of vertices. And what's interesting is, uh, so a, a conjecture here, a possible conjecture here is that, in fact, the only way you can solve these enumeration problems, these optimization problems, very generally, is basically enumeration. So in other words, whenever enumeration is hard, there's no FPT enumeration algorithm. Perhaps there's no FPT algorithm either for merely finding the maximum size, um, maximal subgraph graph from capital F. And you could imagine a proof that would show some kind of result like this. Like, so you could imagine you know, a generic reduction that takes as input a family of instances that are bad for enumeration, meaning there's just like, like way too many maximal subgraphs that belong to capital F. So that would be bad for enumeration because there's just too many to enumerate. And then generically transforming that into a different family of instances, uh, which were W1 hard with respect to the optimization problem. So that I think would be, would be a super cool, uh, super cool result. Okay, so I think I'm over time. Um, thanks again for joining me. Happy to take questions um, for, you know, I can definitely stick around for, for at least a half an hour. Um, so very happy to, to answer any questions that you have. So thanks very much. Okay, so uh, there is a question from Bart Janssen. Can you say something about the values of C for which a typical n-vertex graph from popular generating models is C-closed? Is it merely sublinear in N or even pologarithmic? Um, good question. Let me make sure I understand the question. So the question was, what, like, what is C for standard network benchmarks? Or is the question samples from the gen models? What is their C? Bart, could you run? What is C? Okay. The question is what is C? All right, so good. So let, let, me, let me, there's two versions of the question, one of which I um, actually haven't studied, but one we have. And I even have a slide to illustrate that one. Let me get, so one second, Where, when did I, when did I give this last? Probably. Probably Fox 19. Okay, good. So one version of the question is, you know, um, so, so let me tell you one thing we haven't done. Um, what we haven't done is taken, say, like the preferential attachment model um, and taken, or, you know, or probably we'd, we'd start with more modern um, generative models. So you know, the latest and greatest generative model, uh, take random samples and compute um, for what C are they C closed. Okay, so that we have not done. Uh, what we have done is we've taken sort of the most, you know, well-studied benchmarks for social Tim. networking. Yeah. Are you showing us a slide or not? I, I was just about to. Oh, okay, good, because we still see the, the previous one. Okay. See the old one, yeah, okay. Um, right, so I'll stop the old one. And... Um, so we so we we haven't actually studied samples from generative models. You know, admittedly we should, but we did at least um, study you know the benchmarks that social network analysts really use. Um, and so let me show you some. I mean, the paper has more, but here's a slide that has some of it. Boom, boom. Right. So if you look at the bottom of this slide, so did, did you see a slide that says weekly C closed at the top? Yes. Great. So that table at the, at the bottom, uh, so we, we were using the SNAP data set, which is the Stanford network something something. <laughs> so that's sort of, the, those, are the, those are the benchmarks that people tend to use in social network analysis. Uh, the rows correspond to four of those graphs. The first column corresponds to the number of vertices, the second column to the number of edges in each of those graphs. And then the third column, um, that is the smallest C with respect to which the graph is C closed. Now, the, the trivial bound on C, N minus 1. Okay, once C is N minus 1, you automatically satisfy it. Okay, so as you can see, you know, these values of C are sort of well less um, than the number of vertices. But something I didn't get into is, is you know, so to keep things short and, short and sweet, I just gave kind of the easiest to state but most restrictive notion uh, of a C-closed graph, 
Uh, we have also investigated relaxed definitions of it. And so there is this notion of weekly C close graphs defined in that same ICAP paper with Fox et al. Um, and so in the fourth column here, and so it turns out all of our results for Max Cleek hold equally well for weekly C closed and C closed. Okay, so it actually doesn't matter. And so here in the fourth, the fourth column, you start getting really compelling results. So this is the C for which the network in question is weekly C closed. And here you see you really start getting down into the single digits, you know, even for graphs that have thousands and thousands of vertices. And so the running time of our analyses here is sort of exponential in C over three. Um, you know, C gets down to like eight or nine. You know, that's that's uh, you know that's not that's not so crazy. Here is, I guess, a follow-up question from Bart: Is there a large gap between the degeneracy and weak closure number for these graphs? That's a good question. Um, it's not even. I mean, is it? I'm not even sure it's obvious that they're. Let's see. Is it? Are they? Is it clear they're related? I don't know. Yes, they are. Weak closure is almost degeneracy. Vai okay. Ali saying. Uh, let's see. It's a good question to sort of compute that in these. In oh, sorry. It's at most degeneracy. Okay. Is it most so 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 right? That's good, 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 good. Right, good. Um, well, so I guess is degeneracy even lower bounded? So I mean, this this may speak to that, right? So I'm sort of rusty on this, but if, if the claim is that degeneracy is at least C for C closed, right? What you can see here is that weak C gets you way smaller than than C, right? Which then in turn, you know, degeneracy is even worse than that, right? So by having a big gap between the C and the weak C columns, that would at least imply a big gap between what you get from degeneracy and what you get from weekly C close events. Mm -hmm. Is that reasonable? We'll see. No, no. OK. I, I do agree. I, I, I agree we should add another column to this table, which is compute the degeneracy, because you know it's not hard to compute the degeneracy of a graph. So maybe we even did that at some point, and it's been lost at the time. But uh, I think that's an excellent question. That would be a more uh, refined comparison. So here's Vaishali is saying click is in and de de degenerate, but one week closed. So maybe this early. But but let's maybe move to, because there is still one question of, from Uri Mayer that I didn't ask. Can we relax the assumption to approximately see closed, say close in humming distance or when the closeness property holds for most pets? That's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, good question. We, we did not look at that. Um, I, I think that's a really nice question, like how brittle, um, you know, I think if you look at the proof, you feel the feeling is it, you know, like if all you did was like mess up a C closed graph by like, O of one edges or something, uh, you know, just thinking about the proof, my feeling is not to go wrong. Um, you know, if you were able to change, you know, an epsilon fraction of the edges, I'm sure it would be a disaster. Um, but that's not something we ever worked out. So I, I think that's actually a really nice research agenda. You know, under what notions of distance from C closedness do you get kind of graceful degradations in these algorithmic results? That would be cool to see. One more question from Rohit Chata. Chatterjee, for the online learning result, you mentioned that you had overall time step overhead of about log one over sigma in runtime. Where does the one over sigma blow up from the coupling lemma get absorbed? Uh, let's see. So let me go back. Oops, I should go back to the other slides. Um, close, present, screen share. Blah, blah. Okay, so um, right. So just to be clear, so the one over sigma is not about the running time. It's really about right. So that, so um, so when you do online learning, you you do not worry about the running time you up front. That's not your. That's not just. 
you know, the, the way traditionally the concerns in online um, learning have focused on the number of mistakes you make, okay, or more generally the, the regret. Um, and so when I talked about, I'm trying to pull up the theorem. Right, here's the theorem. Yeah, good. Um, uh, so, right, so this, this one over sigma, that's in the mistake bound. Right, so the, so the theorem here is going to look something like, you know, you know, after there's going to be some concrete bound which says, you know, if you use this algorithm, the expected number of mistakes you've made after capital T time steps is just, you know, 10 times square root of T, and then there's going to be a like times square root log one over sigma or something like that. Um, so that's sort of where it shows up, right? And so as sigma goes to zero, that you know, the, it becomes vacuous because it just says, you know, you're making less than an infinite number of mistakes. But for any sort of fixed sigma, you're getting the sublinear in T growth uh, of the number of mistakes that you make. So that's the that was so so that's just a clarification point. Now, Archer, remind me sort of the second part of the question. Uh, where does the one over sigma blow up from the coupling lemma get absorbed? Yeah, it gets absorbed. Let's see. So that's that was this part I skipped, unfortunately. Let's see. Oops, now it comes later. Um, Right, so basically, right, so, so it's here. So it's in the bottom here, basically. So I guess I mentioned this very briefly, that um, you can run an off-the-shelf uh, algorithm like multiplicative weights, and then you know you're going to be doing fine with respect to capital H prime, right? So if the adversary, so in other words, if the adversary was nice enough to actually make sure that it was consistent with the hypothesis of capital H prime, you'd be and the total number of mistakes you make would grow, as it says here, square root of t times log times the size of, of h prime, okay? Which would then boil down to like kind of a, you know, remember the size of the subset is like, you know, one over epsilon raised to the VC dimension. So there's gonna be like a root t times d log one over epsilon. But then there's the second thing, which is like, you know, the adversary only promised it's gonna color things consistent with the hypothesis in capital H. It did not promise it was gonna color things consistently with the hypothesis of h prime. And so what you'd like to show is that like, well, it doesn't really matter, right? Because like anything that it could have been doing with respect to capital H, you had something in capital H prime that was almost the same and you'd be fine. And if you had just like a uniform adversary, that would definitely be true by the uniform convergence results uh, you get for bounded VC dimension classes. Um, but the problem have that. And indeed with a, with a worst case error, it could be that, you know, you wind up coloring things that's, you know, consistent with something in H prime. So you think you're good. Um, but then actually the adversary, you know, is secretly coloring things with respect to some capital, other capital H, and you make a ton of mistakes. Um, so that's where it goes in. And so let's get the next slide up there. Uh, and so basically what happens um, is, um, let's see, right? So, so good. So, so there's going to be this dependence, right? So you see already here, right? There is this dependence on sort of square root T as far as how many mistakes um, you make. So, you know, the bound does keep growing. It's just growing sublinearly. So the coupling is sort of almost like scaling up. Or one way to think about it is like you take each old time step and chop it into one over sigma time steps. Um, so this is not quite how it works, but like roughly you can imagine that this capital T gets replaced by a capital T over sigma. Now that doesn't give the logarithmic that I promised on one over sigma, right? So, so that's not how we do it. We really sort of open up the analysis. You know, we kind of have to use, you know, Bernstein's inequality type trick somewhere to sort of get what we want. Um, but that's sort of intuitively where it comes from, right? The number of mistakes does scale with time steps. And if you're de facto blowing up the number of time steps, you will be blowing up uh, the number of mistakes that you suffer, or at least the bound of the number of mistakes, certainly. Did that, did that answer the question? I hope so. So, so because we are so right now, uh, my suggestion is that let's just move questions to the more questions because Ami Paso has asked one more question. Sure. Let's move the questions. We'll move to the tables. So, uh, first of all, let me just pause the mention about the next talk. The next talk in two weeks will have Carl Brinkman talking about fine-grained complexity of optimization problems. And as for now, I would like to thank team for a great talk. The next